you bought it, you can do whatever you want with it. Not so, say many companies. The advent of the smart world has led to a new definition of ownership. Joining us now to discuss what propriety means in a digital age, Larissa Katz. She's Canada Research Chair in Private Law Theory at the University of Toronto. And Carmi Levy, independent technology journalist and analyst. And Carmi, we welcome you back to the program where you've been many times. It's great to be and here. And Larissa, we welcome you here for the first time. Thanks. And not just here for the first time. It's the first time you've ever been on television. This is it. We appreciate you uh, well, thanks for having me. making your first jaunt with us. Carmi, you go to a store, you choose a bicycle, you buy the bicycle. That means you own it, right? In theory, anyway, up until now, this mechanical object that is a bicycle, and I'm an avid cyclist, and every bike I've bought, my assumption is when I bring it home, I own it, I own every aspect of it, and when I want to change it, when I want to tweak it to my preference, move the seat, change the handlebars, make it my machine, mm -hmm. that I have every right to do exactly that. And I've been riding bikes for decades, and that's always been the case. No one's ever called me on it. When they see my bike on the road, you're violating our copyright. No, this is my bike, this is what I ride. Well, let's change it up a bit, Larissa. Then, instead of a bike, it's a smart TV. It's got some computerized brain in there or something like that. Perhaps you're going to hook up to the Internet as well. If I buy that, do I own it the same way outright as if I were to buy this glass or this piece of paper? Well, I mean, it's an interesting question. Essentially, we are talking about new ways of defining things. So, you know, back to the kind of, you know, things on wheels example. Are you buying a computer on wheels? Or, when it comes to a tractor or a car, are you buying a machine for farming that just happens to have a computing system inside it? You, I mean, it's That's a good a question. question. What's the answer? Well, I think the answer is, if the thing is just, if the computer system is just a component of the tractor, if it is there to make the tractor work as a tractor, you own the tractor, you control the agenda over the tractor, that means you should be able to modify, alter, tinker with that computing system as you see fit. Uh, you may not be surprised to hear John Deere doesn't agree with you. Not surprised at all. Here's the thing. John Deere, you know the guys who make the tractors, they put digital locks on the tractors so people couldn't alter the software that comes on the tractors. And when a petition apparently was delivered to the copyright office in the U.S. asking John Deere to remove those locks, the company says, we only license the software. The owner of the vehicle has an implied license for the life of the vehicle and therefore accessing the software could violate copyright or contractual rights. Does that really, does that yeah. make sense so, to you? So Steve, there's a lot going on in that okay. and so I think we kind of need to break it down a little bit. So the first thing I think we want to focus on today is it's one thing to put a lock on something you sell, it's another thing to try to get the state to back you up in stopping people from breaking those locks. And I think the latter is what we're really talking about today. So I sell you something, I sell you this pen, and I've somehow managed to put a lock so the two pieces stick together. Once I sell it, up to you to break that lock and use a pen as you see fit. So that's the first question we need to kind of figure out today is what is with John Deere going to the state saying, look, back us up, stop people breaking these locks. And then I think when, when once we start figuring that part out, we can start to answer other questions. All right, let's like, work on that. Yeah. Should it be legal for anybody who buys that John Deere tractor to want to break that lock? Well, like any question related to any form of technology, it's not a black and white answer, it's a shade of gray. And the reason being is, let's say I have a, a tractor or a car or any kind of vehicle uh, that is increasingly heavily computerized. Uh, some of those systems some are, uh, manage the infotainment system, so I can listen to music or run apps off of my dashboard. Is it reasonable for me to expect that I should be able to hack away at my dashboard and maybe install some new apps and do some cool stuff while I'm driving? At, well, not while I'm driving, but you know, for the drive, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but you what say, if, sorry, you say yes. <laughs> uh, you say you should be able to tinker with your car and do all that. Within a reasonable, we've been tinkering with cars since the first car was invented. So why, why would we want to shut that culture down? That if you've paid how, however much of your, uh, of your income on a vehicle, that you should have the right to at least customize it to a certain extent to your preference. The question then becomes, what if it's a system that relates to safety or emissions? And so what if it's the system that controls the airbags and you manage to nick into it and, you, and it fails and you have an accident and unfortunately there's a death or an injury. Because the airbag the, didn't deploy. That's right, you because of these the modifications, because the locks were open. So now the company is liable, potentially, open, you know, vulnerable, uh, 
public relations nightmare, uh, what happens then? And so really what they're trying to do is mitigate the potential impacts because no one really knows if this is a safety system or not. <laughs> no one really knows if this is a, is a skilled coder or programmer or not, or if it's just some person on a Sunday who happened to open up the, open up the code, play with it and do some grievous damage. Okay, given that scenario, yeah. do we then need this prohibition in place saying you can't unlock what's, what we've locked? Well, I think actually, if I could just start with a really basic idea of ownership, right? Because this is kind of lurking behind the scenes here. What does it mean to own anything? So what it means, I think, in law to own anything is really very simple. It means the owner has the authority to set the agenda for a thing. So when you buy a thing, and we're going to have to figure out what a thing is later on, but when you buy a thing, that means you set the agenda for it. Not your neighbor, not the guy who sold it to you, not the guy who made it, no other private actor but you sets the agenda. Now that never means the sky's the limit, right? We know that certain kinds of agendas are always off the table. You can't use, you know, your pen to, you know, commit a crime, right? That agenda for your pen's off the table, mm -hmm. right? You can't use your property to commit a nuisance. But any legal use, it's up to you to choose. What about the example he just gave, where if you go into the brains of a car yeah. and you tinker around, because we've sure. tinkered with mm -hmm. cars for 100 years, yeah. but then you end up you know, destroying the airbag system, which is supposed to save your life. So before we get to all the bad agendas that people might set for things they own, we have to ask first, what business is it of John Deere, the manufacturer, right, to one, protect third parties' IP rights, two, to protect the, the public's interest mm -hmm. in safety and security, right, by putting in place digital locks that might not be specifically and only preventing the bad agendas, but also the good stuff too. So really it's a question about whether a private actor, because after all, John Deere is just another private actor. That's, mm -hmm. you know, not the government, right? Whether the private actor gets to tell us what agendas to set. And you right? say no? Well, I say no. I say no. I say other private, the whole idea of ownership anyway is that it's the owner that sets the agenda and no other private actor. And what do you say? I, I agree. We've seen plenty of examples in the technology space of technology being released to the public, open to the public domain, open source, to facilitate people doing what they want with that property, with that content, and creating a greater sum than previously existed. Uh, Silicon Valley would not exist if this ethos were not in place. How do you encourage innovation if you constantly have everything locked behind some kind of door? No, you can't touch that. You can't change that because we're worried about being sued into the next millennium. Truth of the matter is, is increasingly we're seeing the things that we buy are not just physical things, they're being increasingly infused with technology. So more and more code, a greater percentage of the value of that car, of that pen, of that glass is now technology based. It's code. So it's a totally different way of looking at, 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 at what that thing is. Can we is. see more than just value? Mm -hmm. More and more the identity of the thing itself. Of course. Of right? course. What it's makes code. it come alive? What makes it unique? And, what and makes it competitive? Actually, I think maybe we might want to stop and think about, you know, the ways in which Prohibitions on breaking locks not only gives agenda setting power to another private actor who's not the owner, but actually kind of messes with the way traditional property law would define things, hmm. right? So let's just think about a thing. Okay, so, you know, when I say I own this pen, the natural boundaries of the pen are pretty obvious to all of us, mm -hmm. right? But most things in the world, like land or um, certainly IP rights, we need law to help us to define those boundaries, mm -hmm. right? And here's a really old fashioned way that law helps to make boundaries of things pretty clear. It says, if there's a component that is inseparably a part of the bigger thing, right? Like if you have upholstery inseparably installed in your tractor, doesn't matter who originally owned that upholstery. Once it's inseparably a component of that tractor, the owner of the tractor owns the whole thing. So here's maybe what we need to think about sure. is how much mm -hmm. are these computer codes components now mm. of the tractor? Increasingly so, because the, like a few years ago, it might have just been a, a certain component in your dashboard that ran the radio. Now, digital drive-by wire, digital steer-by wire, so that you can't, you can't move the car without using some form of code. It's an uh, integral part of the whole thing now. Exactly, and you cannot separate it. You know, you buy some vehicles that, you know, if you take that technology away, it is essentially sitting in your driveway. It will mm. never move again. It's useless. Let me in here with what General Motors uh, mm -hmm. feels about this since we're talking about cars. They surprised many when they said that the software in their cars is copyrighted. So don't try to break those locks to try to diagnose or fix your own issues. 
Consumerist, the Consumer Affairs magazine, a website rather, um, said the following. Folks who like to tinker with their cars, as well as independent non-dealer mechanics, say they need the copyright exemption in order to be allowed to continue repairing their own cars or keeping their businesses open. Manufacturers like GM say that it's a safety issue. If people who aren't authorized messed with any one piece of software, they could make the entire ecosystem of connected code unsafe. My question is, we've already talked about sort of some of the issues around airbags, but is this really, do you think, at the end of the day, Larissa, an issue of safety? So whether or not, in fact, there are safety issues involved actually is probably more a technical question. But let's even assume that there might be, right? So here we have GM and other car dealers installing locks to prevent this kind of tinkering, right? But we're not really talking about whether or not they should be able to install those locks, which they might want to do because they feel responsible for the safety of what they're selling. Mm -hmm. We're talking about them wanting prohibitions against removing the locks. And so then really what we have to ask ourselves is, what is the real force of their argument? So on the one hand, we have the protection of third-party software developers' rights. And GM might be saying, look, once you break that code, once you break those locks, what exactly do you plan to do? Yeah. Well, everything inside is copyrighted. Well, in fact, locks are about access, never just about use. So when trying to stop people from breaking locks, you're trying to exclude them from access, regardless of the use that results. So in fact, I think the force of their argument is probably not as strong as they think it is. Could you make a deal where, you, where General Motors said to you, or the dealer said to you, look, if you want to go in and tinker, chain, you know, bust the lock, go in there and play around, you got to sign this waiver, which means that if anything bad happens, we're not that's on right. the hook. You're, you're, off, you're off warranty. You avoided you're your warranty. warranty. And that's been in place forever. Yeah, you know, if, if, you, if you buy a car and you put in a nitrous oxide system so that you can drag race it on weekends, guess what? You've just voided the warranty. And that's pretty clear in any ownership agreement. Whenever you buy a vehicle, it's stated explicitly. What's happening now is there's all of these limitations that have previously been agreed to by the consumer when they take possession of a particular object. Uh, now, as, as we move into a technology era, the vendors are saying, no, now we don't even want you to have that option anymore. It's going to stay locked for good. And so, and, and, and you know, authorized guy tinkering in his, in his garage or a third party mechanic yeah, I was who just has nothing say, to what do. About, what about an independent and they, uh, and body they, shop? What happens to them now? Uh, they go out of business if this happens because they have been fighting for years for access to the same tools that dealerships have had to diagnose and fix increasingly tech based vehicles. Hmm. And, and you know, time and again, the courts have ruled in favor of the mechanics because essentially this entire market disappears if this is allowed to happen, which then, of course, gives the original equipment manufacturers, the, the automakers, pure domain, absolute monopoly over the market. Now you have to bring your car back to the dealer every time that check engine light goes on. Is that really the future that we want? I don't know. I, I, I know what my answer is. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm sure most of us really don't want a future like that. Well, Larissa, as we get more and more products that are connected to the web or have these kinds of you know, copyrighted brains in them, how far, I mean, look a bit into the future, if you would, and see where are these restrictions taking us down the road? Well, I think they're taking us in the direction of overprotection of third party rights and in the direction of more and more opportunism by manufacturers. So if we break that apart, overprotection of what's behind those locks, I think is pretty clear. So remember, what is behind those digital locks? Well, a lot of third party rights are actually legitimately behind those locks. But think about what it means for third parties to have private rights. When you get a private right, like a right, essentially, to sue somebody for interfering with your interests, right? You can choose to enforce that or not. So what these manufacturers are saying, let's not leave the third party developers with that power to choose whether to enforce or not. Let's assume that those rights are sacrosanct. Private rights are not designed to be sacrosanct, right? We have the criminal code that tells us rules for how we have to live, and then we have private law. Private law is all about power, not rules. It gives third parties powers to choose whether to enforce those rights. Sort of like imagine I have a neighbor with a beautiful lawn and someone's walking across my neighbor's lawn. What if I run out there and say, get off my neighbor's lawn? I think she'd like me to do that. I think she'd like me to exclude you. It'd sound like Clint Eastwood at that point. Yeah, it sure would sound a bit weird, right? And the reason is, is maybe that person is trespassing but it's not for me to represent that third party's interests. Here's what the legal director for Electronic Frontier Foundation says on what happens when companies place digital locks on their products. Sheldon, let's bring this up. The end result, fair uses are impeded, users are disempowered, and trained to go hat in hand to the Apple store just to change a battery rather than doing it themselves. 
independent repair shops are driven out of business, and the electronic waste piles up as users discard their devices rather than fixing them or donating them for reuse. Help us out with the implications of this kind of a world. Now. Right on the money, because it, it means that we cannot build a third-party, user-based, consumer-friendly ecosystem to manage, maintain, update our stuff. And is that a loss? Uh, it's a huge loss, because the, what's been driving the technology revolution for much of the past generation has been that spirit of innovation. It, let's not forget that Apple was started in a garage. Hewlett Packard started in a garage. This is where all, that innovation begins. And if you squelch that by placing locks like this, like this in place, you, you take that entire culture and you cut it off mm -hmm. at the source and you ensure that it never happens again. And so yeah, you're right. We're gonna have to pay through the nose, go back to the dealer, go back to the manufacturer for everything, the, the smallest issue that we have. And then, well, if we can't fix it, guess what, we're upgrading. And you're right, into the, into the waste pile it goes. I find it interesting that the manufacturing sector, John Deere, General Motors, as, as they're fighting for tighter locks, the technology sector is opening up. Apple introduces a new programming language called Swift 2. Um, open source right from, the start, right, right from the start. Google gives away its Android mobile operating system to any handset manufacturer that wants it and says, go ahead, innovate on top of it. We own copyright, but go ahead, do it, hmm. create a market. Now they own f four out of five, every smartphone sold runs that operating system. So the tech industry has figured out that you can throw things to the wind and allow the ecosystem to build value on top of it. Because if you try to squelch it at source, everybody loses. Apple's really got a operating system called Swift 2. And it's a, it's a developer's language. Oh, I just to, think to that's ironic, given that they're having a hell of a fight with Taylor Swift right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe she should go after them on that one, too. Uh, last word to you here, Larissa, which is, can you see any benefits at all to consumers by keeping these locks in place? Well, I, I think whether, and that's an empirical question at the end of the day, and uh, I'm not sure that I can answer that. There may indeed be benefits to consumers uh, if we don't allow them to tinker with cars, perhaps. But really the point is precisely whether any other private person really has the standing to tell people whether or not they should pursue what we might think is probably a shabby agenda, right? I think this is fundamentally a question about ownership, hmm. right? I might have lots of views about what my neighbor's doing with her property, it's not really for me to decide. Gotcha. Uh, thank you for being your uh, rookie appearance here on TVO. Thank you very nice much, Nice having uh, Larissa Katz here. on our program tonight from the University of Toronto. And Carmi Levy, as always, the technology analyst. Good to see you again, too. Wonderful being here, Steve. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.